Welcome back, everyone, to our YouTube channel, Einstein's Eyes. It's great to have you here. I'm Carl Rosen, an oculoplastic surgeon in Anchorage, Alaska, and neuro-ophthalmologist, fellowship trained. This is my partner and friend, and previously we were co-residents at Albert Einstein, ergo Einstein's Eyes, John Dickoff. John? Hi, nice to see everybody. So I'm in uh, practice in New Jersey, and I, I specialize in cornea and in the front part of the eye, the anterior segment after doing a fellowship in that. And I also do uh, lots of general alphabet. So we, today we're gonna talk about a lazy eye, also known as amblyopia. And there's a couple of categories. We're not gonna get too complicated, but the categories to consider are one strabismus or crossed eye. So that's what causes amblyopia or a lazy eye. And really what a lazy eye is, is the brain suppresses one eye, the right or left, and focuses or prefers a good eye, the non-amblyopic eye. And so when that happens, you lose stereo. So you don't get three-dimensional perception of the world. It's two-dimensional. And you have to remember that. And when someone comes into your clinic and you can't understand why they can't see, you always want to go back and remember about amblyopia. So the other reasons would be an obstruction. It could be from an eyelid called ptosis. So that's from the outside part where it obstructs a kid's eye or a baby's eye. And this usually occurs early in development between birth and 12 years when the brain is developing vision acuity. And if that process gets hindered or prevented from occurring completely or fully the occipital pole where vision is interpreted atrophies, and that's why you get your lazy eye. Again, we're going to try to keep it simple. The other reason, a big category, is something called anisometropia, where you have two eyes that are not the same as far as the type of lens that, that they have or the refractive error. So one eye could be farsighted, one eye could be nearsighted. The better image is always preferred by the brain, and that's the one that's going to be the eye that develops correctly, and the, the less preferred image becomes the lazy eye or the amblyopic eye. So those are the big categories. Also included in the obstruction category, not only from an outside view, which is the eyelid is droopy, but on the inside view as well, where you could have a tumor, or in a kid, it could be a retinoblastoma, which we're always concerned about. And that gives you a white pupil, uh, particularly when it gets large, and those are the categories that we consider and that we examine a patient and look for and then decide on the plan of action. John, any thoughts? Yeah, I think that was a great summary. I, I think I would, a couple of things I would add. So to me, amblyopia, it'd almost be like your child is growing up and they're between the age of two and six or two and seven, and they just literally don't use a part of their body. Now, some parts of the body will continue to function despite that, but the eye is very specialized. So if you, do, if you can't use the eye, as Carl mentioned, you get atrophy. The brain, just that part of your visual center just doesn't develop normally. And because of that, that person, even though the eye health-wise could be normal, that person might never see out of that eye normal. So, you know, I, I agree with Carl. Like, so basically most people grow up using both eyes interchangeably. So it's stimulating the brain. But if preferentially a person or a baby or a kid uses one eye over the other, he basically is suppressing that image, he or she. And he mentioned there's, there's three reasons. One is if the eye's blocked by something, or as we all know, if the eye's crossed or, or going out, what happens is one eye is gonna take control just because you get to confuse two different images. You can't handle that. And then the third is, which I see the most of, and I've seen thousands of cases in my career, it's just one eye is so differently shaped. So I'll give you a good story. I saw a child about eight weeks ago, and he's six years old, he's almost seven, and I immediately detected he had no vision in one eye, and his other eye could see 20-20. And with examination, we determined that that eye was shaped completely differently than his good eye. Because of that, since he, since he was born, he was using his right eye only, and his left eye, because it was so out of focus, it was easier for the brain to just 
suppress the image and not use that part of the brain. So when he came to my office, even with glasses, even everything I did, I could not get him to see out of the eye, despite the fact that his eye was completely healthy. I looked at the nerve, the retina, the blood vessels, the lens, everything was normal. So what do we do? We patched his good eye. So I told his parents, I told him, problem is he's a six-year-old kid. And I knew psychologically it was not going to be easy. He's going to have to go to school. And these kids are going to be all looking at him. What's that? And so this is an amazing story. The principal of the school and the mom got together. And the mom explained how important it was for him to patch as much as possible in school while he's using the eye. So the principal came up with an idea. He basically came out with, he brought to school a book all about patching of the eye. And, he, and they read the book in class. And then all the kids were given a patch to wear for you know a half a, you know like a half an hour an hour for a couple of days just to see what it would feel like and for them to understand why their classmate was going through this wonderful and when he came back not only has his vision his vision now is 2050 it went from almost no vision to functional vision and that was only in 6 weeks so we're hoping by next visit he might be be seeing better wow that's a great story that's, john great that's story. a great story yeah. that really is Awesome principle, right? Yeah, yeah. Holy cow. That's an integrated functioning, well-functioning system. Yeah. John, thank you for that story. And I want to thank everybody for being here. We're going to continue our topics. We're going to branch out maybe even into healthcare policy uh, and some other interesting areas outside the conventional scope of ophthalmology. So we look forward to presenting that to you. Um, and Great seeing you all. We're going to say goodbye now. See you on the next one.